Part 5. Attacks on the Union Right Flank General Lee's plan for the second day called for Ewell's Corps to make a diversionary attack on the Union right to support Longstreet's and A.P. Hill's attack on the left end of the Union line. So at around 7 p.m., Johnson's division attacked Culp's Hill. And about 30 minutes later, Early's division attacked East Cemetery Hill. Philip Lano, in his book, Gettysburg Campaign Atlas, wrote that Ewell was told by General Lee to attack at the same time as Longstreet attacked on the other flank, but that Ewell's attack was both late and uncoordinated, and the execution is a dismal and costly failure, unquote. Before General Ewell launched the infantry attack, he tried an artillery bombardment to support the attack. Two sites were available for Ewell's artillery. Seminary Ridge was too far away for accurate fire. Benner's Hill was closer, but 40 feet lower than Cemetery Hill, and very exposed. The Confederate batteries on Benner's Hill were commanded by 19-year-old Major Joseph Latimer, the boy major. Stephen Sears, in his book Gettysburg, wrote that Major Latimer was Ewell's best artillery commander. He learned artillery tactics from Stonewall Jackson back when he was teaching at VMI. Major Latimer spent two hours and fired over 1,100 rounds and then had to confess to his commander that he could no longer hold his position because of Union counterfire. Major Latimer was told to withdraw most of his batteries and then, while directing his one remaining battery, he was fatally wounded. Johnson's division was told to attack Culp's Hill, and that's these four brigades. Walker's brigade was off to the northeast. They were in their own fight, holding off a mixed force of Union cavalry and infantry, and didn't join the attack on Culp's Hill. To the south, here are Jones's, Williams, and Stewart's brigades. Opposing them on Culp's Hill were two 1st Corps brigades on the north face of the hill, and six 12th Corps brigades. One of the 12th Corps brigades was commanded by Brigadier General George Sears Green. At 62, Green was the oldest Union general at Gettysburg. He was a West Point grad and had a distinguished career as a civil engineer. According to Stephen Sears, Green's boss, Division Commander General Geary, was personally opposed to breastworks, but left the matter to his brigadiers. And what's a breastwork? It's a temporary fortification, usually dirt. And so General Green, a former civil engineer and now a brigade commander, had his men spend the day building breastworks. And according to Stephen Sears, the rest of the division followed the example of Green's brigade. Also, notice how close the extreme end of the Union line on Culp's Hill is to Baltimore Pike. The Baltimore Pike was classed as an improved road, while the Tawnytown Road and Emmitsburg Road were unimproved roads. The Baltimore Pike led directly to the railhead and the Union supply line to Baltimore. Plus, the Baltimore Pike was the Union Army's line of retreat. If the Union flank was turned here, the Pike was threatened. But as far as I know, none of the Confederate commanders seemed to know how close they were to Baltimore Pike. Finally, see an elevation profile from Google Earth. The profile follows this line from Culp's Hill, northeast across Rock Creek to the Benner Farm. And here's the elevation profile. Vertical exaggeration is set by Google Earth, not by me. Johnson's division was attacking from right to left. And the ground isn't complicated. You see that once across the creek, any attack was a straight slog upwards to the top of the hill. Johnson's division attacked up that steep slope in the dark into professionally designed breastworks. Edwin Connington, in his book, The Gettysburg Campaign, called it a hopeless mission. Let's follow the animation. See Johnson's division in the upper right, highlighted in red. Other Confederate brigades are gray. Union brigades are blue. Shortly before the attack, Stewart's and Williams' brigades moved forward and put themselves on the left of Jones's brigade, and they moved forward. 
As they cross Rock Creek, see the Union 12 Corps brigades start moving south. 12 Corps is divided into two divisions of three brigades each. Williams Division is the three brigades at the south end, and Geary's Division is the three brigades on the north. And one of those was Green's Brigade. Remember that General Green was the engineer responsible for building the fortifications on Culp's Hill. According to Philip Lano in his book, there was a debate between Generals Meade and Slocum on taking 12 Corps troops to reinforce the Union left. Slocum was the 12th Corps commander and Meade was his boss, the Army commander. And Meade asked for the entire 12th Corps as reinforcements. Slocum asked to keep back one division, which is three brigades, on Culp's Hill. And Meade said no, but Slocum persuaded him to leave him one brigade. And they agreed that the one brigade that would stay was General Green's brigade. The rest of 12 Corps, five brigades, was sent south to reinforce the Union Army's left flank near the Wheatfield and Little Round Top. So let's watch 12 Corps move south. Green's brigade will not move, as agreed by General Meade, and there in Geary's division. I highlighted the other two brigades in Geary's division that are moving, and you'll see why in a second. Williams's division led the way, south on Baltimore Pike, and then they turned right toward Little Round Top. And the key point is the turn, right here. And notice the brigade sitting here at the corner. That's Neal's brigade from 6th Corps. You'll see them again in a moment. But watch this. Geary's division missed the turn. They continued south on Baltimore Pike, across Rock Creek, and went into bivouac. It's after dark, probably after 8 p.m. Are you laughing? Twelve Corps staff weren't laughing. Where is Geary's division? Edwin Coddington, in his book, blamed General Geary and wrote, As a result of his blunder, 2,500 veterans had walked right off the battlefield and became lost to Meade when he needed every man who could carry a musket. Unquote. Back to the attack on Culp's Hill. Green's brigade was the single 12 Corps brigade left behind to defend the hill. Around 8 p.m., you see at the height of the attack, it was Green's brigade that faced the brunt of the attack, and von Amsberg's brigade from the 11th Corps was brought south to support Green's brigade. And notice that as all this was going on, Early's division's attack on East Cemetery Hill is heating up. The two 1st Corps brigades on the northwest face of the hill were Meredith on the left and Cutler on the right. And remember them from the first day's battle. And notice that the Union positions on Green's south were empty because those units were sent away. Cutler's brigade sent three of its six regiments to the south end of the Union line to hold off the Confederate attack at that end. The Confederates suffered severe casualties. They did manage to occupy some of the positions on the south side of the hill, positions that were left empty when 12 Corps units were pulled away. As far as I know, they ignored Baltimore Pike nearby. Around 9 p.m., as the fighting on the Union left quieted down, General Slocum sent Neal's brigade north, and Kane's brigade, one of Geary's division's lost brigades, returned to their position and tried to recover the south end of the Culp's Hill line, but it wasn't possible in the dark. Early's division from Ewell's Corps was told to attack East Cemetery Hill. The attack was made by Hayes and Avery's brigades, half of Early's division. So where's the other half of the division? Two brigades are missing. Gordon's brigade is behind them, ready to join them, while Smith's brigade is off the map to the east, maybe guarding against Union cavalry. On the Union side, see these two brigades facing northeast. That's von Gilsa's and Ames's brigades. They were Barlow's division of 11th Corps, famous for their defeat on day one at Barlow's Knoll. The position held by Ames's brigade shows in my map as a straight line facing north. Actually, Ames's brigade was in a salient on a 90-degree corner 
one wing facing northwest and the other facing northeast. A few minutes after Johnson's Confederate infantry crossed Rock Creek, Early's troops started their attack on East Cemetery Hill. Stephen Sears wrote that General Early expected this to be a general attack, that his two brigades would be joined on their right by Rhodes's division and by A.P. Hill's corps on Rhodes's right. And we'll see up ahead what happened to Rhodes's division, but I've seen no evidence of any plan by Hill's corps to support Ewell's attack. Whose fault? R.E. Lee, I guess. But Sears wrote that this underscored yet another command failure in Hill's Third Corps, unquote. Also, does this possible command failure in Hill's Corps have anything to do with the problems with Posey's and Mahone's brigades described in Part 4? Note that the ground between the Confederates and the Union position isn't flat. Of course it isn't. I'm going to show you another elevation profile from Google Earth, which follows the line here, which is the path followed by Avery's brigade attacking on the Confederate left. And see here the elevation profile. Avery's brigade attacked from northeast to southwest, which is right to left in the elevation profile. Apparently, both of Early's brigades were not seen while they waited in position. See the start point and the position of Von Gilsa's brigade. The Union troops' line of sight down to Early's troop was blocked. As Edwin Coddington wrote of General Early, his men had lain hidden all day behind a low hill about a half mile from Cemetery Hill, unquote. And Coddington describes how the attacking force came into full view at the top of the elevation immediately in front of the hill, unquote. Maybe about here, and the Union artillery fired frantically before the attacking force reached von Gilsa's line. Notice also, this is surprising to me, that von Gilsa's brigade is only about halfway up the slope. I wasn't looking carefully enough at the contour lines in the map. You can see from the contours on the west side of the road that there's a steep climb on that side. Off to the northwest, see Rhodes's division begin to move into position almost 30 minutes after Early's attack started. Too late. Did they underestimate the time needed to get into position? Both of the Union brigades, von Gilsa's and Ames's brigades, ran away. Coster's and Carroll's brigades were sent in to help. General Hayes was commanding the Confederate attack, and he had a toehold, but sensed his attack was running out of steam. Hayes sent to General Gordon, asking him to hurry, bring his brigade forward. To the west, General Rhodes's division is only now in position, but apparently now it's too late. Considering the distances involved, an attack by Rhodes's division should have started soon after Early's attack, but they weren't in position until long after that. General Hayes, leading the attack, decided to give up. Edmund Coddington wrote, summing up the second day, and he begins, Of course, if Rhodes, Early, and Johnson had moved before dark together with all of Anderson's brigade, but clearly there Coddington means Anderson's division, because the brigade was part of Hood's division. So I'm going to rephrase Coddington and, and make it as follows. Of course, if Rhodes, Early, and Johnson had moved before dark together with all of Anderson's division, The story of the Confederate offensive on July 2 might have had a different ending, for Cemetery Hill was vulnerable to an attack from two directions. Coordination of such magnitude, however, was unheard of in Civil War engagements, and its possibility at Gettysburg should be relegated to the realm of pure speculation, unquote. 